So my good friend Danny did a video three weeks ago on Phil Talk, which I will link, called That's Just Semantics. Later on, we had this discussion about his argument against naturalism. Now, the first item, is and ought, are distinct concepts. Prescriptive versus descriptive. I think he wanted to reverse that. So an is is descriptive and ought or ought is prescriptive. That's where we get into the semantic problems. Danny's video, which preceded this talk, was complaining about earlier discussions we had where I made the claim that we were just arguing over semantics or that his argument had semantic problems. I think that's what inspired this. It was about three weeks ago, so um, just guessing. Maybe I'm not that important to Danny, but I think I'm under his skin. Now, this video is meant to hand wave away semantic discussions. He treats them like, well, let's get into it a little bit here. Get into the difference between a philosophical dispute versus a semantic dispute. Now, one should think of a philosophical dispute in terms of a conceptual dispute. Right? We're talking about maybe what follows from um, a particular concept or what sets of propositions are in conflict with one another to where we need to change beliefs, right? Um, where a semantic dispute is more of a practical dispute in terms of the usages of the words. It's like a language dispute. And so, yes, there is a distinction between our concept versus the language that you use, that you use to describe it or present it. Um, so if there's something in the world, let's say something that has fur with whiskers that says meow or calls out meow, um, you know, uh, uh, we might use a particular word to describe that, a cat, right? And so um, if someone came along and said, well, you know, there's this thing in the world that has all those things, except instead of meow, it goes bark, barks. And you might understand that those are obviously two different things, right? The, the thing that barks versus the thing that meows. Um, but imagine if we, I said that we should call that thing um, that meows a cat, and they think that they should call that thing that meows a dog, right? Well, that's just not how I use the word, right? So, yes, you could debate about, well, you know, if you want to communicate Okay, so that's the hand-waving part. Now we have two objects in the world, they have some properties, and we have words for these objects. But it's a little deeper than that. There's a place where semantics crosses over with this conceptual landscape when it comes to how we cut things up. We can cut up the world of cats and dogs fairly precisely. And we're, we're referring to something outside of ourselves. We're referring to something in the natural world. And that makes it pretty easy. And then it's just a matter of labeling. So what he appears to be saying here is that when I made the accusation that his semantics were bad, that I was arguing with him over how we label cats and dogs. Uh, no, Danny. It was a lot deeper than that. There is a place where semantics and concepts cross over and interact. That is a very complex landscape, as is portrayed in your argument, where you dip into the mind and you start talking about various things in our subjective experience and labeling them. Of course, we have culturally labeled things like desires and oughts and is and belief. And we all kind of know what those things are. But when you try to bring those to a naturalism fight, you end up with a problem. You can't bring subjective cultural naming conventions to a naturalism fight, at least not with bridging the gap. Now, naturalism 
has a way to bridge that gap between what is in the brain and what is a desire and what is a belief and what is a not and all of those things. And everyone has, you know, a long story to go along with it. Now you have on your side, apparently nothing more than our cultural linguistic version of what these things are. And you make an argument based on that without flushing any of that out. Now, on the naturalism side, we can flesh it out. We can actually tell you what's happening in the world, in the brain, and we have a story for that, right? So we can lay out these stories about the natural world and how it makes these thoughts and thoughts and desires. Are you doing the same thing on your side? Are you showing us how these cultural ideas and linguistic ideas hacked that landscape of things in our mind apart. I don't think so. And you assume that everybody's just going to agree with you. And that is where we got into a semantic problem. Okay, semantics is about meaning. It's about how we, not, not just how we label objects that we all agree on, uh, a particular division or a cutting up of the world that we agree on like cats and dogs it's far deeper than that when you're talking about these subjective things these cultural ideas about what's going on in our mind how we communicate with one another as other minds then we got a big problem and we have to do a lot more work and that work is semantic work you know we're gonna we're gonna cut things up in a certain way and we're going to attach labels to them. So semantics is not just labeling, but it's also a cutting up of the conceptual landscape that we're going to be communicating on. Now, when I looked at your entire argument, you asked me at each point if I agreed with each premise. So number one, is an odd or distinct concepts? Yes. Uh, most concepts are pretty distinct, and if you ask anybody that they're going to agree with it okay so there are different odds uh you know yep i like the way you cut them up you know well it's okay i mean i could have cut them up differently whatever so more semantics i agree with it i'll, I'll give that to you number three that which expresses an ought is normative or prescriptive there we start getting in the deeper waters and I can agree with that too, so I don't have a problem with it. Number four, normativity creates the possibility of failure, success, right, wrong, good, bad. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that statement, but I'm already getting into deeper waters yet, and I can kind of see where you're going with this. You're sort of building your, your case into your words, into your semantics. Number five, Descriptive states express how the world is. I notice you capitalized is. And that was even a sign of deeper waters to come. Number six, truths about the natural describe how the world is. Okay, so now we're getting into truths about what is natural. So we're looking at a way to cut up the natural world or a naturalistic paradigm, right? Number seven, desires create the possibility of failure, success, since they are standards themselves. Now that's really interesting. Still deeper waters. You brought in the word desires. And then number eight, you say desires are normative. Yeah. And that would derive from, I think, seven and one. Let's see. And, and wherever it is that you hang the word normative on it. So that's your case. And then you rush right to your conclusion. So, I mean, I'm already in way over my head as far as agreeing with you on how you have cut up the subjective landscape with these words, with these labels. So there's a cutting up and then there's a labeling. It is the cutting up that we're going to have a problem with. And you say, if all of these are true, then desires are not natural states. Uh, so desires create the possibility of failure success since they are standards themselves okay 
So where do we have pause? Okay, normativity. So you're calling desires normative. Okay. There are different knots. Uh, that which expresses a knot is normative. Okay, so now you've tacked the odd onto the normative, and up above you've said that an is is not a knot, basically. This is this is a pretty uh, common argument, I think. Uh, kind of old, kind of dated, but but common. So anyway, so it's how you cut up the natural world that you're in a problem with. And when you talk to naturalists, they keep trying to tell you that, okay, you're talk a naturalist will take a Cartesian coordinate system of uh, three-dimensional space and time, and they lay out where particles are and you know, we can go to the chemical level and say where atoms are, and we can lay out a case for how desires are something, a process in the brain. And we can lay out a case for how when we think something, we ought to do something, how that is explicable in terms of neuroscience. And we keep asking you why you can't see that, why you can't look at it. Now, Obviously, we're coming at this from two very different mindsets, right? Two semantic landscapes where we've cut things up in very, very different ways. What I don't understand, I understand what you're doing because I know putatively what desires and oughts and normative and prescriptive and isness is and all of that. And right and wrong, good, bad, failure, success. We understand all those things. So we're understanding you. What we don't understand is why you don't understand how naturalism does it. So if it is naturalism that you're attacking, then you should at least understand the semantics of naturalism before you attempt to bridge from this subjective cultural landscape to the naturalist. Because you have to attack us on our ground, don't you? If you're going to disprove naturalism, you at least have to attack us on our ground. And you have failed to do that. And I was a little disappointed in how badly you failed to do that. So let's see if we can look at a little more of your video, run to the end of it. So let's look at the rest of your video and see what else you had to say. It's only five minutes. I guess we can do that. It would be well, well you know, you need to use, use this utterance, utterance this word, word uh, to, to denote... denote uh, the thing that goes me out. But notice there's not really a difference in, in, in concepts. We do have the same idea about, you know, we differentiate the thing that says meow and the thing that, that barks, but we're using different representations of these things, right? And so you can have a whole debate about that. Now, I think that's fairly uninteresting, right? Well, you know, okay, you want to be confusing, you can, you, you can call the thing that says meow or call out meow, Dog, but that's just not how you use the term. Okay. So, so that's, that's just no, I don't think it's uninteresting at all. How you cut up the subjective landscape when you're talking between a philosopher and a naturalist who is going to rely on neuroscience and tell you about what happens inside the brain is a very interesting discussion. You think it's uninteresting because you're reducing it to this ridiculous idea that it's as simple as classifying objects out there in the world. We're classifying objects in a subjective landscape internally, which uh, humans are not very good at. The philosophical dispute has to deal with our difference in concepts, right? Where it is a semantic or sometimes called a verbal dispute, right? is not so heavy on the concepts, right? It's heavy on the usages of the, of the words, right? And, and now, now, unfortunately, unfortunately um, this, this phrase, phrase talking past, past each other really reflects a semantic, semantic dispute that hasn't really, really been identified yet. yet. Right. Um, um, imagine, imagine that these, these people, people right, right, that, that one used... I really like that. That's a good way to flesh out this idea of talking past each other. So that one's a keeper. I think I'll, I think I'll bookmark that. The, the, the sound, sound dog or the word dog, dog to, to represent, represent the thing that goes meow. meow. And, and that's not been kind of revealed or divulged to the, the, the person, person they're talking to. to. 
right? right? Then there's going to, you know, they're, they're, they're going to say all sorts of things that the other person is going to take to be false, right? right? Um, and, and if that's, that's not cleared up, up right, you can, you can, you can be, be fooled into thinking that there's some kind of conceptual dispute. Now, also a kind of fallout from the fact that there, that there is a sort of a distinction is that many people use this as a, a rhetorical device, um, as a kind of ob objection or rebuttal to someone's argument for a particular position. Um, so, so let's say I give an argument A is B and B is C and therefore A is C. And then for whatever reason, right, they find that argument to be inconvenient or they seem to not bring the Fauci um, uh, issue with it. Um, but rather than doing the intellectual work to show which premise is not right, they'll say, oh, you're just playing with the words. This is just semantics, okay? Well, the best response that I have is to say, well, what word am I using differently? Because if there's a semantic dispute, that question is the answer. So you have to be very careful about identifying these these sorts of um, conversations as to not w waste your time, right? And to kind of nip it in the butt, you need to, you need to ask the question, okay, what, what word are we disagreeing? It is truly a semantic dispute because I took our... Right, nip it in the bud, which I chose not to do in our one hour thing because I wanted you to make your presentation. But I was like, holy shit, do we have a semantics problem? Uh, the way you're cutting up the subjective landscape and somehow completely missing the deeper discussion about when something is prescriptive or something can uh, is subject to failure or success that we are talking about the human ability to plan motor activities execute them in the future sometimes they work sometimes they don't but we're dealing with time and we're dealing with projection into the future we're dealing with the human mind's ability to map out time and create this imaginary future where we can plan things out and that discussion uh, needs to be had as well in order to map from your landscape your subjective philosophical uh Quinean, whatever the hell you're doing landscape to that of a naturalist and there's a lot of work to be done there and we could have more discussions about it what i don't get is why you don't understand that this is what we're doing we're naturalists right we look at humans as organisms and we look at you know, well, humans have brains and they have bodies and they move around in the world and they do things and they plan ahead i mean all of that is fleshed out in a naturalistic way or in a subjective way and we have to meet or it, you have to cross over into our world and tell us why our naturalistic cutting up of that subjective landscape does not work and you completely fail to make that case you're using words uh, bringing bringing words to a naturalism fight like uh, bringing a knife to a gunfight if you don't get the reference is not a good idea, Danny. You got to go further. And see, when Manny and Doubting Thomas uh, talked to you in the after show, or when we went we went off live, I think, or no, you guys went on on Saturday Night at the Atheist and discussed it. You didn't seem to get what they were saying. And they kept trying to hammer you with this over and over and over again. It's like, don't you see that desires can be fleshed out naturalistically? And if you can't see that, if you think that you're cutting these words up in this way is persuasive, you're wrong, Danny. And here, just as a reminder, I'm linking the philosophical dispute to just a conceptual dispute. That's take to be, at least in the analytic tradition, the Western methodology of doing philosophy to be a kind of analysis of concepts. Right? We're not so much interested, at least the people that approach philosophy in that way, and how should we use the words? Um, but yeah, that's, I just wanted to share those thoughts, just to kind of for y'all to be aware, right, of these, um, this distinction such that, you know, you don't waste your time, you can really address 
people that are trying to escape a, a real conceptual dispute by saying it's just merely. Okay, so I suspect you're talking about me because I did this uh, some somewhat earlier in our in our relationship, and uh, I don't know. Like I say, maybe I'm not that important to you, but I think it was me that got under your skin with the semantic thing. And you're failing here. You're failing entirely to grasp how deep this subject of semantics and cutting up the world and cutting up the subjective landscape is. And you're failing to reach out onto the, across the aisle to the naturalism and make a reasonable argument against naturalism from within the framework of naturalism. Now, we can get into how you could find naturalism false. That would be another really good discussion. Uh, but but I guarantee you, your method here uh, is flaccid. <laughs> anyway, that's all I got.